I'm going to start by telling you a very short story about an incident from 2006, and then I'm going to try to talk about its significance. I'm going to say a few things about 2006 uh, also in, uh, in a few minutes. On February 19th, 2006, 65 workers at a coal mine in Mexico died in an explosion. When their union leader charged the company and the government with outrageous and egregious violations of health and safety laws, and by the way, a subsequent investigation showed that there were 48 health and safety violations, the union leader was fired. So the workers at two mines went on strike, and at a steel factory owned by this same corporation, they occupied it. Two of those occupying workers were shot and killed by riot police and the army. Then, when workers at two of the work sites had been starved, bullied, and harassed back to work, but at one site remained out on strike, the government agreed that they could all be fired and replaced. At this point, and this is a key link in the story that I'm telling you, a spokesperson for a certain company praised the firing of these 2,000 workers and said, this sets a precedent so the workers will think harder. The spokesman was speaking on behalf of Scotiabank. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons I begin with this story, because it brings together so many of the key themes that we are talking about as we organize, educate, and mobilize for May Day 2011. And I think it, it shows us a microcosm of the world in which we live, and in particular, these points. First, that capitalism, in all the ways that Lee was just describing, has utter and callous disregard for human life. Secondly, that in this extraordinary neoliberal phase of capitalism, governments, their militaries, the employers, use state repression to increase the fear the insecurity and the precariousness of workers' lives to make them more vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. Thirdly, that poverty, violence, and insecurity, the sort that I've just been describing here, displace people and compel them to migrate in search of better lives. Fourth, that racism and colonialism are inherent to all the practices of big business from the global north. And fifth, what I came to in talking about Scotiabank, that Canadian corporations are complicit in exploitation, violence, and displacement, beginning as Lee underlined for us with the displacement and dispossession of the indigenous peoples of the Americas, and the ongoing displacement and dispossession that are characteristic of capitalism globally. And we need to say all of these things because there are some people out there that I still encounter who say things like, well, migrant justice is just a one-issue politics. I'm sorry. Migrant justice speaks to every aspect of the gendered, racialized, colonialist capitalism in which we live. If you don't, in fact, address issues of migrant justice and indigenous sovereignty, as has already been underlined for us, then in fact you are not addressing all of the interconnected issues of the world in which we live. We also need to recognize that with the global economic crisis that began in 2008, all of these features that I have been describing became massively intensified. Or put differently, that as the global economy, the global capitalist economy, was encountering all of its problems with its banking system and multinational corporations and their profitability, they turned on all working class people, for sure, 
but they turned on migrant workers with greater ferocity than any other section of the global working class. And this is because they, they have a basic solution to their crisis, which is that they're going to make the poor, the laboring people of the planet pay for it. And they need, as they like to put it, greater flexibility. But let us be clear what flexibility means to corporate capital. It means greater ability to hire and fire, to remove people from a given state if their labor is deemed no longer necessary, to pull them back in on a completely, completely precarious basis if and when they want them again. And they want to foster and deepen every division possible among the poor and the exploited, and in particular, to create the notion that some people are entitled to rights within a nation state and others aren't because of where they're born, because of the status they have or the lack thereof within the country in which they labor and so on. And while this is a global process, the attacks on migrants are happening in South Africa, South Korea, the Gulf states and so on, my remarks are going to be focused on the U.S. And Europe, I know that Farah is going to address the Canadian case, but I just want to remind you of some of the following in the U.S. case. First, that the U.S. government is spending $2 billion a year to militarize its southern border with Mexico, that every year hundreds of people die trying to cross that border, and more than 300,000 women, children, and men are arrested and detained each year. They're thrown into 400 privately run detention centers which have no standards of regulation whatsoever. And we know that they die in these places. Between, for instance, 2003 and 2010, 107 detained migrants died in the custody of these places, places which a former U.S. Department of State, State Department official, refers to as hell holes. That's a direct quote. And so we need to understand that that's the context, and it's happening in Britain, it's happening in France, it's happening in Italy, particularly by way of the dirty deal that Italy did with Gaddafi in Libya, where anybody that they detained they can ship to Libya without even, any, without even a basic hearing. It's happening across the whole of the global north, and as we know, it's happening here in Canada, and it's getting worse in this age of austerity. But we also need to remind ourselves, and this is where I return to 2006, that migrant workers are not simply victims. Everywhere, they are resisting, they are organizing, they are fighting back. Good. In 2006, which is where I started, of course, as you know, there was the mass upsurge of migrant workers on May Day in the U.S. And I'll just read you a quick passage about it. On May 1st, over a million people filled the streets of Los Angeles twice in one day, in two separate marches. It was the largest mass protest in the history of the city and possibly the country. Hundreds of thousands more paraded in Chicago and New York, cities with Latino and Asian communities going back many decades. And then the writer goes on to talk about Dallas, San Francisco, San Jose, Louisville, Kentucky, Nashville, Tennessee. And then quotes one of the organizers, Nativo Lopez. The protests seem spontaneous, he said, but they come as a result of years of organizing, educating, and agitating. Don't forget that point. I'm going to make one last comment about it uh, at the end. In France, a 10-month strike by 6,000 sans-papiers, workers without papers, in 2009-10, won major concessions from the Sarkozy government to regularize or normalize the status of thousands of people once they had proved they had been in the country for five years. Not surprisingly, Sarkozy is now reneging on this deal. 
But the point is, they engaged in mass strike action by thousands of non-status workers. And last week in the Czech Republic, a march organized by the Initiative for Migrant Workers' Rights and the Initiative Against Racism was a week of activism and a demonstration to protest against the exploitation of migrant forest workers. I underline these things because we must never lose sight of the amazing courage, bravery, creativity, imagination, and initiative that migrant workers have shown across the history of capitalism. They will organize, they are organizing. And one of our responsibilities as people who stand for social and global justice is to seek out every avenue in which we can assist those processes of resistance and organization. It's why when No One Is Illegal Toronto puts out the call for a May Day action around migrant justice, we need to say this becomes the clarion call to all of us who are serious about challenging the racialized order of colonialist capitalism uh, in which we live today. May Day is historically International Workers' Day, but there is no International Workers' Day to speak of unless the most oppressed, the most exploited workers and their needs are put to the forefront. One of the great organizers of the amazing uprising uh, of people in Cochabamba, Bolivia, against water privatization in 2000, put it, when asked, well, where did this come from? This huge uprising that broke the back of water privatization, that drove a multinational corporation out of your city. And he, he remarked that it required years of patient work, ant-like, honest, clear, and committed. And I think that's what no one is illegal has called upon us to do. Not just to build a single demonstration, but to build a demonstration that is part of building a movement. And to be, as Oscar Oliveira says in that quote, patient, ant-like, honest, clear, and committed. Because if we do that, if we organize, if we create solidarities, if we build communities of resistance, then we can, in fact, stop this juggernaut against indigenous peoples, migrant workers, and all workers the world over. But it means taking that call seriously and making sure that this May Day, we mobilize noisily in our thousands to send a very, very clear message that no one is illegal. Thank you.